there, but it's not plugged in. Okay, great. It's already in a couple of days. Okay, so you're good. J Jason, I'll link to the microphone off that. Okay, Excellent. Great. Just don't cough. Here, but this one is the one for that goes because this is all about having fun. Yep. Yep. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you for being here on yet another spring break week. This spring break spring break extends, I think, several weeks. I don't know why. Uh, we have a special guest today, but before that, a few comments. Uh, during Grand Rounds in September, when I deliver Grand Rounds and I talk to you about uh, Bailey Ashford and how he discovered that hookworm was affecting people in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, I told you that he did that because he was able to compare parasitic eggs found in the stool of patients with the pictures on a book, a book written by Sir Patrick Manson, and Sir Patrick Manson, considered the father of tropical medicine, was actually um, died on this day back in 1922. In China, he actually found, while he was investigating some mosquitoes, he found filaria worms in the tissues of mosquitoes, and he was the first to say, you know, mosquitoes and these insects can actually transmit infectious diseases. In 1894, he proposed the mosquito malaria hypothesis, which was the foundation for it to be discovered later on. He moved to Hong Kong in 1883 and developed a medical school there, and later on co-founded a dairy farm, which was supposed to develop milk from cows that were contamination-free. And he did all this work following the scientific methods, which was very influenced and promoted by Sir Francis Bacon just 200 years before. He was an English philosopher who really spoke about how scientists should concentrate on certain important kinds of experimentally reproducible situations that he called prerogative instances just a few centuries ago. But today, we're going to talk about life and death. And life and death, as simple as those things may seem or should be, Everything about them and everything in between remains controversial. And it reminded me that on this day was the birth in 1903 of Gregory Pincus. Gregory Goodwin Pincus. Who was Gregory Pincus? He was an American endocrinologist who did a lot of work about the infertility properties of steroids. And in fact, it was through his efforts that the birth control pill was developed. In 1934, Pincus actually published a uh, work showing that he could develop in vitro fertilization of rabbits. But the public wasn't ready for test tube babies, and he gained notoriety instead of fame. He moved on to a smaller independent laboratory, kept on doing work, worked on progesterone, and ultimately that turned out to be the contraception that many people use today uh, back in 1960. And so from the beginning of life to the end, we have questions, and sometimes we're in clinic trying to decide, is this patient, re can we rehabilitate this patient? And this reminded me that on this day was the birth of Howard Rusk, R-U-S-K, R-U-S-K, an American physician who is considered the father of the science of rehabilitation. And he developed this trying to establish rehabilitation efforts for soldiers during World War II. So birth, rehabilitation, and today I introduce to you someone who's going to talk to you about the end of life, Joseph David Rotella, who uh, is well known to many of you. He's been around the town for quite a number of years. He's the chief medical officer of the American Academy of Hospice and, uh, Hospice and Palliative Medicine. He's senior vice president and chief medical officer of Hospice, and he has an appointment with us where he serves as associate director for the Palliative Medicine Fellowship Program. He obtained his undergraduate degree from Harvard. In 1984, he became a doctor from the University of Cincinnati. He did internship and residency uh, at that same location. More recently, he obtained a master's in business administration in 2010. He's spoken and written about this area. He's won a couple of awards, just mentioned a few. In 2007, he won the Pioneer Award from the Kentucky Association of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. In 2011, he was honored with the Dietz Wolf Education Award from Northern Healthcare. And he even has an award with his name that he may talk to you someday. <laughs> Dr. Rotola, 
Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. So uh, I do have a position as Chief Medical Officer for the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and I have my own healthcare consulting company called Catalyst HPM. Um, I'm going to be sharing my own opinions. We're not going to talk about anything off-label or anything in which I have a commercial interest. And what I'm hoping we'll get out of this today is, with a case, I'd like to illustrate how not having a timely patient-centered conversation can result in unnecessary suffering and explain why there's never been a better time, now is the right time, for all of us to learn how to have these conversations. And then to explore the use of a very simple tool called the surprise question as a trigger for when to think about having these conversations. And finally, to outline a basic approach to how to have a good conversation that's patient-centered that looks at planning for the end of life and how you can learn more about it. So um, it's a time-honored tradition for good reason to start medical talks with a case. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the good fortune of attending a plenary speech at the American Medical Directors Association National Meeting, and it was right here in Louisville. And the speaker was Louise Aronson. And she um, started her talk about narrative medicine, about telling your story, with this quote. One death is a tragedy. One million is a statistic. Who knows who said that? Correct. Joseph Stalin. So how many medical talks start with <laughs> Joseph Stalin? But you know, there's something really there, right? When we look at aggregate experience, it's very easy to distance ourselves from it. When you hear about one person, it's truly a tragedy. Now, um, she went on and said there's four reasons for doctors to tell their stories. Their stories about their own experience, their families and the patients they care for, to foster empathy, to raise awareness, to teach, and to advocate for change. Well, I kind of want to do all those things today, and so I'm trying to take her advice. So for one thing I can tell you, if you don't like the direction this is going, um, you can send her an email. <laughs> but in, in her lecture about um, how doctors should tell their story, she says, well, what story should you tell? And one of the things she said is, you should tell the story you've never told. And so today, I'm going to tell you the story I've never told. For the first time, I'm going to share with you the story about the death of my mother eight years ago. And I'm going to go right to the punchline. My mother, Sally, despite having a son who is a hospice and palliative medicine specialist, she actually died naked, scared, in pain, far from home, among strangers. And how did that happen? She was 72 years old, divorced, living alone, and had a nice laundry list of medical conditions, morbid obesity, social anxieties, depression, arthritis, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, stage 3 chronic kidney disease, allergies, poor hearing, cataracts, and bad teeth. Any of those sound fatal? She didn't drive, rarely left her home, but she read a dozen books a week. She managed her own activities of daily living and her dozen or so medications. She walked from room to room with difficulty, and she struggled with her personal hygiene. Now, she had two sons and two daughters, all of whom are healthy and successful. Three of us lived within two hours drive from her and five grandchildren. And she always put the needs of her children and family way above her own needs. Very important to her. She placed a very high value on her privacy and independence. She raised all her children to be good citizens and especially not to expect special treatment. She, would have been, she taught me to be embarrassed by that introdu introduction that I got. Right? She was a self-effacing person who was appalled by anybody who would create a scene. 
And as an example of that, one Mother's Day, we took her out to a really nice restaurant. She put on her best outfit. And wouldn't you know, during our meal, the waitress came with a full bottle, a full pitcher of ice water, literally tripped and poured the whole thing down the front of my mother's dress. She shrieked involuntarily. And I think for the rest of that time, she spent more time apologizing for having screamed than the person apologized to her for having poured the ice water on her. So that's my mom. Well, things changed when we had a family meeting. Her longtime primary care doctor, who knew her well, called a family meeting at her office, and her kids and their spouses gathered with her to hear about an important concern. We didn't know for sure what it was going to be. The doctor did most of the talking and mostly talked to us rather than to my mother and expressed that she had a worry that mom was no longer safe that she couldn't live alone and take good care of herself anymore. And it was time for the family to step up and do the decent thing and make her live in a safer way. Um, I checked in with my siblings to make sure I wasn't just projecting the, the shaming that was in that. It was very kind and well-intentioned, but the implication was any good family would not let a woman live this way anymore. And I certainly thought that maybe APS would be called if we didn't you know, do something. So this led then to a spiral down. <laughs> Mom didn't want to move in with any of her kids or hire private caregivers, but she thought staying home would now shame and worry her kids. So uh, she compromised on assisted living. And the day after we moved her to assisted living, she fell off a raised commode, which is supposed to be safer, but it's not what she was used to, and broke her heel. So that was an emergency room trip, three days in the hospital, and now she can have skilled nursing rehab. So she returns then now to the skilled nursing unit rather than assisted living. And four weeks after that, she was downgraded to intermediate care because she wasn't making progress with physical therapy. That was a hard moment for her because it turns out she liked her physical therapist. The, the physical therapy wasn't doing anything for her, but she liked the conversations she was having with the physical therapist. By the way, when, uh, when we finished that family meeting, an interesting thing happened. The doctor said something like, I don't want to have to worry about your safety and under her breath so that just her kids could hear, my mom said something like, well, maybe you don't need to have me as a patient then. But she didn't say it to the doctor. So um, after we're decertified down to intermediate care, she really didn't seem to have anything to look forward to. She was often in pain, but like so many people in her generation, she suffered in silence. She didn't want herself or her children to be difficult. You know what I mean? You don't want to be labeled difficult. For one thing, she didn't believe in asking for special treatment. But also, I think she might have been afraid that if we were labeled as difficult, then what care she was getting might even be compromised more. Who knows? So the last time that her grandchildren visited, she gave them some money and sent them off on an errand and told them to buy, them, buy her a bunch of nice greeting cards. That following week, many of my mom's friends and family received special thank you notes with checks in them. The last time I visited her, with some effort, we managed to get her up into a chair. I wheeled her down the hall, and we, went, we looked at one of these little bird enclosures. It's kind of a, a glass bird cage, and it had all these little finches and these little guinea fowl. And we just sat there for maybe 10 minutes and just watched the birds going about their business and it felt like a respite. And when I put her back to bed after that and gave her a kiss, it actually felt like something had changed, something kind of final. Now, at no point are any of us talking about death, dying, the end of life, hospice. What's she dying from, broken heel? So not long after that, she had an episode of chest pain. She couldn't breathe. She was rushed to the emergency department. Uh, we got a call from the nursing facility, followed by a call from the emergency department. 
That second call, we were told that she had gone into a cardiac arrest and died in the evening. At which point, I turned to my wife and said, I'm not surprised. At no point going into this did I say I wouldn't be surprised. But when it happened, I said, I'm not surprised. We met as a family in the emergency department. We comforted each other, viewed her body, and heard the story of her last hour. The nice emergency department nurse reassured us by telling us that she seemed really scared when she arrived. Um, that the whole time that the ambulance was transferring her, she was worried that they were going to be too rough with her and had to keep reminding them that she has a broken foot, please be gentle. And she wanted us to know that the team had fought really hard to save her. At which point, my sister said, but I'll bet she didn't. And that was our experience of my mom. The aftermath was that we saw her doctor again, because her doctor, who was really a good-hearted person, came to her wake. And it meant a lot to us. And in honoring my mom, we didn't say anything like, well, why didn't we have a different conversation? Because we don't make a fuss in our family. So what are the themes that comes out of this story? First thing I wanted to show you is that a doctor can tell their own story and lean into it. And any of you that are uncomfortable with this whole issue of death and dying, I recommend you go ahead and lean into it. It won't kill you to talk about it or think about it. And it might make us more empathetic to our patients and families. In my mom's case, there was never a conversation about the possibility she was nearing the end of life or any discussion about what mattered to her. I asked my sister what she thought that fateful family meeting was it about, and she said, I thought the doctor was going to tell us that she was dying of something. But really, the whole conversation was about, you're not safe. You have to do something. Since there was no conversation about her goals, we de she always defaulted to the standard goal for whatever level of care she was at, right? So when she was in the home setting, the, the doctor said, the goal is for you to be safe. And so something has to be done. When she was in the nursing home, the goal is to be rehabbed until she couldn't be rehabbed. And then when she had her final episode of chest pain, the goal was to resuscitate you. She had a living will, but would a living will count when you're having an acute MI? That's what the death certificate said, acute MI. And I thought there wasn't anything acute about her death, but that's how she died. So there was never any discussion about taking any other path besides the default. The care was fragmented. Uh, that was the only other time she saw her doctor. I mean, we saw her doctor. She never saw her doctor again who called the family meeting once she went into assisted living. We saw her again at the wake. There was no attention to pain and suffering, really. Uh, no support for our family before or after the death. We all pretended she was going to get better because she was pretending, and so were the doctors and nurses. And she didn't want to make a fuss. And out of respect for her, none of us forced the issue including her specialist son, who knew better, because she would have needed to have been invited by her medical team to talk about these things. It's just the kind of person she is. What could have been different if someone on the medical team had invited her and her family to have a conversation about the end of her life? I think we might have established comfort as a primary goal. I think she might have been left in the home in the first place. Um, possibly could have consulted hospice or palliative care, but I'm wondering if a hospice would have admitted her. I don't think the nursing home had a palliative care team. Maybe they had, had somebody like the physical therapist who could have sat with her, though. We would have insisted on managing her pain and symptoms better. We would have visited her more. We would have attended more to her legacy, more than just watching birds for 10 minutes and sending some greeting cards. And she might have completed something like a pulse form that might have said, you know, if I get sick again, don't send me to the ER. Keep me comfortable here in the facility. None of that happened. Okay, so I've shared my story with you. That's the one. And for me, that's a tragedy. But I'm pretty sure that this has happened a million times. And it's the million you're not seeing or we're not responding to. So that's why I wanted to have this talk. Do we have the conversation as often as we should? Um, there's a lot of evidence that we don't. I'm just sharing two details with you here. 
Um, you know, the American Heart Association has a recommendation that patients with congestive heart failure during their annual routine visit have some discussion about their end-of-life goals and plans. That's actually only done 12%. 12% of doctors actually do that. Um, interesting study recently of uh, cancer patients. Uh, that most they, they actually surveyed cancer doctors and they about when they would have the conversation about things like your CPR preference, uh, possibly hospice, where you'd like to be when you die, for their terminally ill patients. And what they found is most of them don't have that conversation until they've run out of treatments to offer or the patient is really feeling bad. But they wouldn't have that conversation with someone in treatment who seems to feel okay. But why not? So uh, I wanted to show you a little bit about the variation that's occurring in Medicare spending because that's probably related mostly to whether we're having these conversations and putting patients in the center or not. Uh, this is a, a depiction of Medicare spending in the last six months of life uh, based on things like the Dartmouth Atlas. And you can see a huge difference. In Grand Junction, Colorado, the average is $8,400 per patient. In McAllen, Texas, it's over $21,000 per patient. Huge difference in what treatment is being given to these patients at the end of life. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see a big difference between McAllen, Texas and Colorado. Culturally, don't they wear cowboy boots and ride horses and drink a lot of beer? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. There's, so what's the difference? Well, you can also look at, uh, say, the uh, variation in hospice utilization at the end of life, and you see the same difference. Um, you know, Grand Junction, Colorado, more than 40% of the deaths were served by hospice, and there in McAllen, Texas, less than 20%. Big difference. And just in general, hospice is underutilized. Most recent statistics we have, less than half of patients actually get hospice care before they die. And of those patients who do get hospice, half of them get less than three weeks, many of them just hours or a few days. It's not being utilized. Is that because patients don't want it? Apparently not. This is a study I'm sharing with you of uh, uh, attitudes of Medicare beneficiaries. So this is before they're terminally ill. They're asked, if you were terminally ill, how would you feel about these things? Would you want to spend your last days at home? 86%, yes. Would you avoid life prolonging drugs even if, uh, you know, would you avoid life prolonging drugs if they would make you feel worse? 84% said yes. Would you take comfort drugs even if they shortened your life? 72%, yes. Would you avoid a ventilator if it would only get you an additional month of survival? Yes. Would you worry about too much treatment? or too little treatment, that's a split. They were just as a concerned that they'd be over-treated as under-treated. And when you look at those attitudes and compare them to the geographic differences in hospice utilization or Medicare spending at the end of life, it's not the patient preferences that are different. The patient preferences are the same in both places. So if we're treating one group very medically and another group more holistically, it's not because that the people in Colorado want something different than the people in Texas. It might be whether we're asking them. Because it turns out there's a, a lot of specialists in McAllen, Texas. Okay, so when we talk about, you know, why this conversation doesn't happen more often, uh, I often hear about a lot of barriers. Um, I cheated and put it up for you already. I was really going to ask you all what you think the number one barrier is. So let's just stop for a second. Who wants to share what they think the biggest problem is with, with having this conversation in a timely way with patients? Doctors? Doctors' discomfort with opening the whole topic. And what makes the doctor uncomfortable? So, um, so I appreciate that you, you, you're, it's like I put you in there as a plant because I said we got to get over it. So you know I'm all about the doctors, right? I got to get over it too. Uh, 
Certainly one barrier is that doctors are not initiating the conversation. And when you ask, find out why, one reason is they may feel like they were never trained in how to do it and they're uncomfortable doing it. Another is that they like to focus on uh, science and things they can fix and emotions are not comfortable for them. And so again, we have to get over that. Some of them think they're taking away hope and harming their patient. And that's not what the literature shows. In fact, when people are in a rough spot and you talk to them about it, they generally feel more in control and more hopeful, not less hopeful. But, but there's also time. Doesn't this take time? How much time do you have when you're struggling with your electronic medical record and trying to do volume so that you can keep your secretary employed and things like that? It, it, it takes some time. And you don't get paid for it, and nobody taught you how to do it. Yes, Ruth. Right. Okay, great. So you've raised two points. One is the sort of fragmentation of care in which there's a lot of cooks and, and who's the chief cook and who's going to have the conversation. Everybody just takes care of a part of the patient. Um, that's one reason. And also the identifying who is the person that I should be having this conversation with. And we're actually going to talk about the surprise question a little bit and how that might be one way of getting there. So thank you. Yes. So this is a great point. When you have a lot of different dots with different roles, um, each of them is focused on their toolkit, what they are good at doing, and, um, and of often there isn't that coordination where the whole team's getting together on what needs to happen. Now, interestingly, you can see this reverse, and instead of every doctor saying, it's not my responsibility, they're not dying on my organ, instead of that happening, uh, there was a recent, uh, I don't know if you all saw this, I, I can't remember, it might have been in the New England Journal, I'm not sure what, what uh, journal it was in, but there was this recent uh, feature where they said who should have the end of life conversation, should it be the primary care doctor? They said for a cancer patient, should it be the primary care doctor, should it be the oncologist, or should it be the palliative care specialist? And they had three guests, one from each discipline, who made the case why it should be them. The oncologist said, no, it needs to be me. They're dying of cancer, and I'm the one that knows all the treatment options. We had the palliative care doctor saying, I'm the expert in this. You wouldn't have, uh, you know, you, have, you want a surgeon to take out a, a, a tumor. Well, you need me to have this conversation. And we had the primary care doctor saying, aren't I the quarterback running the whole thing? So interestingly enough, I'd like to see us fighting over who's going to have the conversation rather than uh, nobody having the conversation. Yes. That's a great point. So, you know, if you're going to open this conversation, and sure enough, what the patient says is, uh, I want comfort oriented care with support for my family, you say, Great, that sounds like palliative care. Uh, and you find out that hospice isn't available for one reason or another, and then you try to find a palliative care service. They're not in the hospital, and, you, and there isn't one. So, yeah, that's a really good point. Now, of course, part of the solution to that is making sure we have universal access to high quality palliative and supportive care, which we don't have today. But you know, in this era of healthcare reform, since it brings a lot of value, that doesn't mean we won't have it in the future. And the first step is to let the patient, you know, engage, right? 
Okay, I'm going to move a little more quickly through this next part. There's a lot of evidence that patients do want us to talk to them, that we don't take their hope away. This is just one I'm studying with you. It was about uh, patients who actually had metastatic cancer, and they were asked um, how do they want to hear their prognosis and how do they want doctors to support their hope. And here were uh, almost all of them agreed on these four top things. I want you to be realistic about my likely future, acknowledge me as an individual, give me a chance to ask questions, and I want my doctor to tell me personally. That relationship is so important. And I just will point out again that when we say, but I might hurt your hope, there's many, many things people can hope for. And one thing, I hope you don't come out of this uh, feeling too depressed. Human beings are resilient. And when they're faced with problems, many of them cope and adapt. And this is what happens with hope. As we go from hoping for a long life or a miracle cure or a spontaneous remission to hoping that maybe we'll outlive the predictions to maybe hoping we can make certain goals, then we want to just enjoy the, the beauty of everyday life. Then we start looking for individual worth and meaning, um, comfort, having uh, our family well cared for, a peaceful death. All those things are good things to hope for and can be things people can really get motivated and, and build their hope around. So we don't destroy hope when we're realistic with people, as long as we're not cruel. Now, if you're talking to a patient and you get this shocked look and they say, don't go there, don't go there, but invite the conversation. And of course, what this comes down to is that patient-centered care means that all these decisions should be shared decisions, where we bring the medical piece, the patient and family bring their values and preferences and, and experience, and we work together to find the best thing. So to do that, to do shared decision making, the patient has to know what their health care problem is, what their options are, the benefits, risks, and costs of all the, the good options. You need to know their values and preferences. Uh, you need to know their ability to care for themselves and make decisions. You need to discuss what's known, make recommendations based on matching what you know about the medical treatment with what their goals are. You can't just say whatever you want's fine. They need a recommendation from you about you know the medical stuff, but you should base it on their values and preferences. Check in, make it explicit, or defer a decision. Okay, so there's an opportunity here in our medical culture. I mean, when I asked you about barriers, I thought you were going to say we have a death denying society and they don't want to talk about it and it's a big taboo, and you didn't say that. So really, what you all said back to me is our medical culture has a problem. But I want you to know our medical culture is changing because of health care reform, right? And you see more value-based purchasing, ACOs, bundled payments, mandatory quality reporting. In fact, Medicare is telling us they're going to accelerate the shift toward paying for value for the outcomes of populations and not for volumes of procedures or the number of visits you make. And in fact, we're only a few years away from that supposed to be the dominant payment method for us doctors. And how do you get there? Advanced care planning, patient-centered care is one of the ways to drive better experience for the patient, better outcomes. And guess what? It saves money, too, because you don't waste money on care people don't want. We're seeing now a pay code you can use for chronic disease management. There's also a pay code now for advanced care planning, although Medicare doesn't reimburse it. But there's talk that by next year, there may be a reimbursement also for you just to have an advanced care discussion. So all that talk about death panels five years ago, it's a new day. You're probably going to get paid to have these discussions. Things are changing. OK, so why do I believe now is the time in our society? I have this new role with the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. And the first thing they told me is that you've got to have a social media presence. So I had to get on Twitter and got addicted to it like immediately. I'm an extrovert. I love this thing. You send out a, an idea, and somebody immediately retweets it. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> And then you, you start retweeting each other's stuff, and all of a sudden you have this community of people. You have no idea where, they're, where they are. And what we tweet to each other on the hashtag HPM, which is for Hospice Palliative Medicine, any of you tweets that want to follow <laughs> what's going on in Hospice and Palliative Medicine, go to hashtag HPM. And every day, somebody, there are at least five or six articles, blogs, videos, movies coming out about better end-of-life care. I've never seen anything like it. Here's a few examples, though. The Institute of Medicine uh, released a really important 
report called Dying in America this fall, in which it found that despite all the efforts of hospice and palliative care and everything else, we still don't do a good job of managing people at the end of life in this country. And in particular, we don't do enough advanced care planning. So it's really calling for people to have the conversation. If I had told you five years ago that a surgeon from Harvard would write a book about demedicalizing the care of people at the end of life, and it would be a New York Times bestseller, 25 weeks and running, would you have believed me? But that's the facts. People want to hear about this now. The Conversation Project was started by Ellen Goodman. She's a, a national reporter that I think wrote for the, the Globe for many years and stepped down from that to found this, this organization that's just about motivating patients and families to have the conversation, even if the doctor doesn't bring it up. The Conversation Project is about next time you get together for Thanksgiving, put aside a little time and have the conversation, which I did. It freaked my sons out. They survived it, OK? Here's another example. Entrepreneurs are getting into this space, real money entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs. And nothing would shock me anymore. There's a, a game now you can buy, a set of game cards called The Gift of Grace. And it was actually designed by a design firm called Act the Action Mill. And this game, people are now playing these games in cities in the, in the country. Folks who don't know each other gather on a Tuesday night, and they pull out this box of cards, and they sit down with a bunch of strangers, and they pull cards out, and they have to share things about death, the end of life, how they want the end of life to go. And people have fun doing this. Unbelievable. Death cafes, end of life book clubs, it's all real. I don't know if you all saw this, death redesign. Go to the link and check it out. It's a big article about the leader of the Zen hospice, who is a, a Buddhist physician, is linking up with the world's most famous design firm, IDEO, and real life money entrepreneurs. And their goal is to redesign death. Interesting. Choosing wisely still cranking along. And more and more, when I see these uh, recommendations that are coming out from medical societies, they often now include things about incorporating goals of care discussions. So for example, just in the last two months, these two new uh, recommendations came out. The uh, ASTRO is the Radiation Oncologist Society, in which they now have a choosing wisely recommendation, which says, don't start palliative radiation without a discussion about goals of care. And the American Medical Directors Association, those are your nursing home doctors primarily, they actually now have a recommendation that says don't transfer a frail elder from the nursing home to the hospital without establishing their goals of care. So you see, it's really a theme now. Now's the time. You don't have any excuse. Uh, Scott Simon, NPR Weekend, any of you follow the death of his mother? You guys are not, your guys aren't on the Twitter, are you? He tweeted from his mom's bedside his whole experience of her last days, and then wrote an article about tweeting mom's goodbye. I've got a link up there for you. Oliver Sacks recently wrote about his getting his terminal diagnosis. Leonard Nimoy, before he died, was tweeting out about his last days. People are not running away from this like they used to. I don't know what it is. I think the millennials don't have taboos. Nothing is off limits, not like the silent generation my mom was part of. And here's a good example. Uh, this last link I put up here, teenagers face early death on their terms. This is an article about um, dying young people who want to plan the end of their life and insist on it. OK, so maybe I've made the case that we don't need to be the barrier anymore, and society's not a barrier anymore. So when should you have the conversation? During routine preventive care. It's a great time, annual physical. Whenever there's a new diagnosis that's serious or a change in level of care, when patients are nearing the end of life, before they're too ill to engage, and before they're in acute medical settings where they tend to get disempowered. So the surprise question, would I be surprised if this patient died in the next year? 
this is part of something called the Gold Standards Framework developed in the UK. It's a, a, a nice framework designed to improve access to palliative care in the United Kingdom. And you've got the link on there. They find this really works, especially if you combine it with looking at general and disease-specific indicators of decline. And so here's one study that shows how the surprise question works. This was done at the West Virginia University uh, with oncologists. They looked at over 800 cancer patients. They asked the oncologist, would you be surprised if this patient died in the next year? Out of the group in which they would be surprised, only 7% died. Out of the group in which they would not be surprised, 41% died. That's a sensitivity of 75%, a specificity of 90%. There's an almost 8% hazard ratio of your dying if the doctor said, I wouldn't be surprised. We didn't say, are you sure? Would you sign them up for hospice? No, those aren't the questions. The question is simply, would you be surprised? It turns out that our gut instinct is good. But you have to actually ask and answer the question. So for example, the whole time my mom was dwindling, I had some gut level feeling that she was at the end of her life. But it wasn't until they called me and said, your mother died, that I said, I'm not surprised. <laughs> that didn't help me to be not surprised in retrospect. It has to be in real time. So let me tell you uh, how I got my first date with my wife. I'd been friends with her for several years in college. And we were both in English class and English lit majors. And she was kind of cute and kind of fun. And, kind of a friend. And, you know, it's the end of our senior year, and I'm out jogging with my buddy, and we're talking about our lives and how we'll never have dates and we'll never get married and life's so miserable, we'll, we'll be lonely forever. And, uh, and it gets around to, well, what kind of a person would you marry if you could? He asks me this, and I say to him, probably somebody like Mary. And then he looks at me and says, well, why don't you ask her out on a date for crying out loud? OK, it's not until I say that's the kind of person I want to marry that I realize that's the person I want to marry, OK? So with this surprise question, you have to ask it. In other words, when you're in case planning meetings, when you're in family meetings, I mean, you just have to actually, before you go in the room, you have to stop for a second and say, would I be surprised? And if the answer is no, think about, does that change anything? OK, now we're going to talk about having the conversation. And I'm going to actually give you a little bit of a of a training around this. I recommend five Ps. Think about purpose, preparation, pause, presence, and perception. That's easy, right? Purpose. When we sit down to have a conversation with people, it is not to download information. It's to build a relationship. OK? So even if we don't come, even if we don't come to a decision, it doesn't mean it wasn't useful. Because completing those tasks is only one thing, earning trust, expressing empathy, gaining a deeper understanding of what's important to the patient, that's important too. We should go in prepared. Like we should know what resources are available if they want comfort care. I agree with that. We should confer with our colleagues and teammates so we know who's on first and who's on second and who's going to have this call. We should find a good time and place and have the right people present. And then I say this, stop for a second. Just pause for a second. Still your mind. Take a couple breaths. Don't skip the common courtesies. You know, palliative care docs that do these, con these talks all the time, we move a lot of furniture around to make nice circles so everybody can see each other. And the first five minutes of every meeting is everybody introducing themselves and their relationship to the patient. And everybody needs to know who's in the room. Everybody should sit. Nobody will be interrupted. During this time, we need to be present with our phone off and not answering tweets and text messages and listening and allow silence and allow feelings, including our own. And then we need to be in a perceptive mood, not a judging mode. In other words, watch how people are reacting, try to understand the emotions they're having, express empathy, look at the interpersonal dynamics, seek to understand more than to download information. We also need to be aware that these go better if the patient and we are in a good mental state and not hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or have to go to the bathroom. Take care of that stuff first so you can pay attention to what counts. That comes out of the recovery programs, Alcoholics Anonymous and programs like that. 
they actually know that when people are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, they're more prone to relapse. So they tell people to manage those things. Be aware. So don't go into this thing if you're bedraggled. Ask, tell, ask. Ask the patient permission. Ask the patient what they know. Tell them what they need to hear simply. No jargon. Let them absorb it. Ask them to repeat it back to you. And Do they have further questions? And if you get stalled, tell me more. Tell me more about what information you need, about what, how you feel about this, about what this means to you. Just keep digging. You know, there's more than one kind of empathy. This is from Daniel Goleman, the Harvard Business Review. He writes about emotional intelligence. Cognitive empathy is the ability to understand another person's point of view. It's intellectual. Emotional empathy is the ability to feel what they're feeling or understand that. And empathic concern is the action part of it, is knowing what they need from you. They might not need from you for you to burst into tears, or maybe that is what they need from you. But empathic concern is about knowing what they need. Sometimes people say oh, they're not good at empathy. You know, not all doctors come into this because they're loaded with empathy. They may be loaded with good intentions. Um, you know, the, the, Dr. Buckman was one of the real pioneers in physician communication, and I went to, I got to see him before he died at a big national meeting, and he got up in front of everybody and said he thinks that, that doctors uh, are Aspergoid, that we have, uh, you know, mild Asperger's syndrome on the average. And he included himself in that group. And then he went on and said, but we can learn how to interact with people. So if you need to learn empathy, here's a couple clues. Just be, become mindful and present. Focus on your own breathing. Observe the interaction like you're up at the ceiling looking down. Don't get lost in your own thoughts or feelings. Let them pass. Fake it till you make it. Actually works. If you're too empathetic, if you're bursting out in tears, if you can't get through your own emotions, then here's what you have to remember. There's more than one kind of empathy. There's the heart-to-heart -heart empathy of feelings, and then there's the head-to-heart -heart empathy of trying to see it from another person's perspective. Move into your head a little bit more. It can be done. Finally, doctors are explainaholics. This was a remark from James Tulsky, who's a communications expert, palliative care doctor. It was quoted in a CNN article called Instilling Empathy Among Doctors Pays Off for Patient Care. The article, which I've, again, got a link to here, really shows that you can teach doctors empathy, and it makes a difference. So now I'd like to give you a six-minute training, and then I promise we'll wrap up very quickly after that. And this is from Dr. Diane Meyer, who uh, is a prominent palliative care doctor, uh, founder and director of the Center for Advancement of Palliative Care. I found this online. It, any of you can access it. Here's the link. Let's see what she says about how to have the conversation. Just as you wouldn't send a young physician in to do a surgical procedure without a lot of training and practice and supervision, having conversations with persons and their families about very complex medical decisions in the context of a serious illness is a procedure. And it requires training and practice and supervision, just as any other complex medical procedure requires. I typically approach these things, first of all, by making sure I understand this patient's medical situation, their prognosis, their treatment options, and the pros and cons. Next, I make sure that I communicate with the patient and their family that this is going to be an important conversation at the, and that the right people need to be in the room. We have to remember that 70% of human communication is nonverbal. So it's both the space around the family and the doctor as well as the doctor's own facial expression oh, and body the language. Furniture so the first thing is to find a room which has a door that closes and is quiet. Then you arrange the chairs in a circle so people are facing each other. I always get a pitcher of ice water and some cups and some Kleenex because there's often tears and it helps people to be able to deal with that. Everyone will go around the room and introduce themselves and say what their relationship is to the patient. And secondly, I want to assure everyone that everyone will have a chance to speak and no one will be interrupted. The next step then is to ask them exactly what the other doctors have told them. And this is where you get the opportunity to hear that they've heard a lot of different things that actually don't align very well, which is unfortunately very often the case in modern medicine. This is the stage where you remember the three words ask, 
tell, ask. And the first ask is finding out how people like to get information. And what that does is in the 90% of say, yeah, I want all the details, they have given you permission to tell them. So you have essentially placed the power and the control over the exchange of information in the hands of the person and their family. The tell part, which we doctors think should take up the entire meeting and we spend a lot of time feeling anxious about is actually the shortest part. The tell part is where you say, for example, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Mrs. Jones, but the PET scan has shown progression of your cancer. And then you stop talking because nothing you say after that is going to be heard. It's exactly what they were afraid of hearing. You've said it, you've got to give them a couple minutes to process it. And it will be emotion, this may be when you need the Kleenex or the water. Um, and when you've spent enough time hearing their reaction and saying, I'm, I'm sure this is really upsetting to hear, it's not what you hope to hear, you then ask them to tell you back. So that's the ask, tell, ask. Mrs. Jones, sometimes I tend to use big words or language that is medical, and, and I just want to be sure that I've been clear. Can you explain back to me what you understood from what I said? And then people will kind of take a few minutes and then they'll pull themselves together and then you'll ask them to explain back and then they'll ask you what's the next step doc? There are a couple of really difficult questions that doctors dread and the first one is doc am I going to die of this disease? And the right answer to that question is barring some unexpected accident yes this disease is what you are going to die of. You have to understand this is not going to come as a surprise to your patient or their family. They just need validation of what they already fear and know deep inside themselves. And that's when your preparation that you did before the meeting it comes in handy because you will be able to explain the options and their pros and cons and how you're going to help them figure out what the best path for them is in whatever time they have remaining. A very important step that I think is often missed by busy doctors is to write down what we said and also when you are next going to see them and how they can reach you, what number, and hand them the piece of paper. That piece of paper is you. They're going to take that home. It's a transitional object. It's a reminder that you're there for them because, again, what that does is it takes the patient out of the role of being a cog in the disease treatment machine and puts them in the role of an active participant and essentially captain of their own medical ship. My hope is that we'll see a transformation of medical education, nursing education, other health professional education in the next 10 years so that no one escapes from medical school or nursing school without being to, able to demonstrate highly skilled ability to conduct difficult and challenging conversations with seriously ill patients and their families about what matters the most to them, what gives their life meaning, how can we help them achieve what gives their life meaning. That's what makes this work such a privilege because we can help people at times like this. I hope it will restore the joy and pride in being a healthcare professional. You can find that very easily by Googling. It didn't take me anything to find. So um, just a couple, real quick additional tools you have now. Um, as of a couple weeks ago, uh, you now have a medical orders for scope of treatment that can be used in the state of Kentucky. I got to be there when the governor signed the bill. We worked on it for about five years. So uh, that again can allow open up the topic to be more than just do you want CPR or not or what are, you know, do you want what do you want if you're in a vegetative state? A five wishes is a great advanced, expanded kind of advanced directive where people really get into what their goals and wishes are. There are now all kinds of programs to teach doctors how to have this talk. They have names like Vital Talk, Onco Talk, Jerry Talk, Intensive Talk, 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 Talk. You have no excuse if you tell me I can't get trained anywhere because you can now. And you know, Lori Earnshaw's not here, so I'll say, I'll bet you, if you wanted to go and, and attend a few family meetings with her team, I'll bet she'd let you do that. You think she would? Yeah, we think she would. 
uh, there's also videos from a Dr. Angelo Volandes that explain to patients and families in very simple, concrete terms what resuscitation and things like that is. So I'm going to leave you with a call to action. We might have then five minutes for questions. If you are uncomfortable having patient-centered conversations about the end of life, like I am uncomfortable talking about losing my mom, lean into it, work on it, get over it, okay? Hey, the water's fine. It didn't kill me to do this. Routinely ask and answer the surprise question, preferably out loud around other people during care planning meetings. Get trained, practice, and have these conversations. And go ahead and be an ex explainaholic in recovery. And when people express emotions, don't try to talk them out of it or give them more facts. Just let them have it and respond empathetically. You can do it. And my mom and I will thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate you uh, reintroducing us to this conversation. I want to turn that conversation upside down, just for the sake of argument. Okay? I'm a clinical care doctor. I have these conversations all the time. I'm not saying I'm great at it. You don't want to have these conversations in the clinical care meeting. But, but this is what they ought to do because mm -hmm. of the problems that you described mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. But I've learned by learning about clinical care that the weaning process, the weaning from the venerable process, many people believe is for the patient to get better to the point of having some kind of generation. And yet many doctors believe that the weaning process is only for the doctor to get comfortable. Mm -hmm. tells us that we need to put the patient at the center, that we need to put the family. I would argue that these conversations are happening in part because we now have the ability to do everything for patients. Mm -hmm. And since we have the ability to do everything, we better define mm -hmm. how much of that do they want to receive. If we didn't have the ability to do everything, we might not have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I, I want to ask you about this cultural issue, and I want to base it on my story. Suddenly he's interrupted and asked who would go, go to the clinic. And he says, come with me. So I go with him at the clinic. And we're sitting down with a, an elderly gentleman and a young lady. And they're speaking in Chinese. I have no idea what they're saying. Okay? I know he introduced me because he said, this. And I look like this. <laughs> and I know something was wrong because the x-ray on the wall had a big mess. I know what's going on. I don't know what. After 15 minutes conversation, we go outside and there are about 15 family members outside. All of them embracing him, shaking him. They shake my hand, they drink a guy's hat, and they give me food. And then we walk back to his office and discuss this. None of these people were the patient. Uh -huh. Not a single one of them. The decision was made culturally and very often in that culture uh -huh. that the patient is taken out of this discussion for his or her own sake. That the family chooses a person to make decisions about the future of this individual in order to spare this individual from the pain and anguish of understanding the reality of their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. That is acceptable. That is what needs to be done. They won't have it any other way. Mm -hmm. Eastern, West. Mm -hmm. How do you do this? Okay, great. Hey, good story. Thank you. Uh, okay, so it's always important that we provide care that's culturally sensitive. That said, in those cultures in which the patient is not told the diagnosis, but the family is, they know. They know. I, I you know, I, I like to teach with film. So, um, you know, uh, Akira Kurosawa, the great Japanese film director, uh, did a, a 
a movie called Ikuru about a man who gets stomach cancer. And there's a scene in this movie which was made in the 50s. And in Japan in the 50s, that was the, the, the dominant mode, in which he's sitting in the doctor's office waiting to meet the doctor. And one of the other patients says, hey, hey, if they tell you you've got an ulcer, if they tell you don't eat this, don't take that, you're done for. The, the other patient is telling him how to interpret all the code that's coming. And, and so even if it's culturally appropriate in that culture not to disclose to the patient, that doesn't mean the patient doesn't know, and it doesn't mean that they don't miss out then on some important things. I'll tell you a really quick story. Uh, that's also true of the uh, traditional Russian medical culture, would be not to tell. So um, I had a, a Russian Jewish immigrant patient that was dying in our hospice unit, and not only her son, but the interpreter, who was also from the Russian Jewish community, and others all said, do not tell her she's dying. Do not tell her she has cancer. Fine, what can I tell her? You ask her if she want, has any questions. She didn't. Does she want me just to work with her son? That's what she wanted. Fine, culturally appropriate. The day before she died, she suddenly sat bolt upright and started yelling, I am die, I am die, get my son. Her son runs into the room. You're not dying, Mom. Yes, I am. Here's what I want to tell you. Okay, so the fact is that just because you're in a culture where we don't talk about it doesn't mean that the patient isn't, in fact, aware and wanting to be able to have some kind of conversation about it. So I'm still a proponent of, yes, be culturally sensitive, but we should be advocating in all cultural contexts for putting the patient in the center of the care to the degree that they accept it. I think it's still the right, right thing to do. Right. OK, great. So you're asking the question, is it really just that we don't have enough time because we're not paid for it, because we have to do high volume in order to keep an office running? Yes, in the traditional fee for service, that's the case. It's a perverse incentive. But when you look at where healthcare reform is going, and they're doubling down on this now. It's value-based treatment. It's population health management. They're going to say, you have a panel of patients, and how your patients as a whole are doing in terms of their health outcomes and their satisfaction with their care, and what you're spending on them is what we're going to use to measure of what we pay you. When that happens, that's like flipping a switch, because these conversations deliver that value. So yes, I agree. In today's world, you don't have time. But it's changing. I think it's a good point, and cultures change. And what I'm telling you is I think our society in the United States is at a tipping point. And I think things that we thought would never happen 10 years ago are going to happen. Just like you know, 20 years ago, people would have said there will never be an African-American president or gay marriage will never be legal anywhere. Well, things do change, and I think this is changing. Great. That's a really good point. So again, when you put the patient family in the center, sometimes what you hear is, we're going to beat the odds. We don't care about your science. We're praying for a miracle. We're going to lay on hands, and it's going to happen. And my response to that is, that's great. I hope so, too. In fact, you want me to pray with you, whatever. Of course I would love a miracle. And can we do a little bit of planning while we're hoping for the best? Can we do a little bit of planning? for if that doesn't happen, because they call them miracles for a reason, because more often than not, they don't happen. But absolutely, I would support somebody in their wish for a miracle. But that, that doesn't absolve me of the responsibility to still talk about what's going on now, what are your options, what are the pros and cons.
Right. So I think that's a really good point. So when I quote to you that if you sit down with people who are well and say, when you're sick, what do you want? The odds are when they actually are sick, they might answer differently. And, and that's true. They might. And, and especially early in disease, they might cling to, to treatments. Yes. But it's also true that people who say, I wouldn't want to live if I couldn't drive my car, get to a point where they can't drive their car and they go, you know what, things have changed. This is still a, a life I'm, I'm interested in living. So yes, this is all fluid. And the real point is, you never know where somebody is unless you sit down and talk to them. Just like the most simple question is to ask the surprise question, would I be surprised if they die? That's not rocket science. You know how you find out where people are? You gotta talk to them. It's the only way. Oh, exactly. Okay, so a lot of great points in there, and let me just agree with all of them. We've come a long way in end-of-life care, but we're still, we still have a long way to go. But we're moving the right direction, and we're at a tipping point. Yes, you can't just have a rote talk in your pocket and apply it to everybody. In fact, when you're dealing with lack of trust, you know how you build trust? By listening. And so if it's not so much important than what you know how to say. It's are you going to sit down with your patient and routinely listen to them. And so uh, I agree with you. You can do more harm than good when you bowl into a discussion and you're not watching the patient's cues and you're not doing what's welcome. But the vast majority of people, if the door is open, are actually willing to go there and they generally feel empowered and better if it's handled appropriately. So thank you for that. Thank you all that continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. I appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Do you work here in town?